Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Agri-Food Conversations, uh, brought to you by iSelect, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, uh, and I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture, uh, and each month we have a specific theme. Uh, this month's theme is oceans and aquaculture. Um, on today's call, we're joined by John LaRiviere, CEO of Scoot Science. Scoot's web-based sea state dashboard allows aquaculture operators to see what's happening below the ocean surface right now and provides forecasts of the days ahead. It's designed to help fish farmers understand ocean risks faster so they can take action, identifying environmental risks to each part of the farm and leveraging historical data to reduce future risks. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in the Scoot Sciences market, your potential customers for Scoot Sciences products and services. You have built a company similar to Scoot Science, um, or you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities that Scoot Science may face. Now, before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Uh, and then, John, if you flip to this next slide, a few process comments um, while the poll is running. Uh, we are not soliciting investment. Um, this presentation is to provide information to help Scoot Science find customers, mentors and other strategic relationships to help them grow their business. You can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce John LaRiviere, CEO of Scoot Science. John, we're all eyes and ears, feel free to take it away. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting Scoot. Um, I am gonna leave full screen for a second though, because Zoom threw up the poll window right in the way, so to get rid of it. Okay, are we back on full screen? Yeah, okay. We're back. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Scoot Science. Scoot is an ocean analytics group that's focused on giving marine operators the data management, um, the modeling, the forecasting, and the analytics that they need um, to navigate ocean risk and changing ocean conditions. I think for, um, you know, an, an overall introduction to Scoot, uh, you know, it's, it's helpful to zoom out a little bit and just look at, you know, the state of the oceans more broadly. So we would say, uh, you know, at Scoot, the oceans are really on the front lines of climate change. And what I mean by that is that ocean operations that are in some way coupled to conditions in the water experience um, all kinds of effects of a warming planet, not just related to changes in temperature, but because mixing in the oceans and the chemistry of the oceans is strongly linked to ocean physics. What we see is that ocean operators really have been experiencing in recent decades more ocean variability and a move to new baseline states that their businesses haven't seen or felt before. Um, there's kind of a one-two punch um, when we're talking about ocean change um, in that there's changes to ocean physics, but then also changes to ocean chemistry. All of that is important when um, you're doing agriculture in the oceans, right? So you can imagine that the, the growth rates, the productivity of fish are inextricably linked to the water conditions where the fish sit. So Scoot is focused on helping businesses understand that ocean change, understand ocean variability, and then set up the tools that they need to mitigate the change, but also to increase the lead time that they have for ocean risks that we know are going to pop up. Now, some of that's done from an operations dashboard that I'll share with you here. It's our flagship product called Sea State. Some of that's done by a team at Scoot um, that's just focused on risk and finance. And, and primarily the risk and finance group at Scoot is working to take some of the tools that you see used in land-based agriculture um, so risk and finance tools um, that are really taken for granted as being available for land-based farms to the oceans. And to do that, you really have to have a clear understanding of ocean variability on these farms. 
we think that the journey starts with foundational ocean data. So when I say foundational ocean data, I'm talking about temperature, salinity, oxygen uh, for fish farming groups, plankton. This is data that the aquaculture industry has been collecting uh, for many, many decades. I'd argue that the aquaculture community today has one of the best ocean observing platforms on the planet. With that kind of foundation ocean, ocean data, you can make the oceans manageable, right? So, oh, we're going to back up <laughs> slide here. So you can make the oceans manageable. And we do that with the sea state dashboard. Let's see, my animation isn't working so much. You can make the oceans insurable. And once you cap the downside risk for extreme ocean events, you can actually make oceans investable like they haven't been before. And that's what we do at Scoot Science. So when I talk about making oceans manageable, um, what I mean is that our team shows fish farms the full picture of the surrounding ocean environments where they're farming. And we help the teams forecast the extreme events that they're going to work to mitigate through operational decisions day in and day out. We do that through uh, our, our software platform called C-State. C-State is the full integrated view of the surrounding oceanography where you have a farm, um, along with the surrounding meteorology of a farm. Once you get a handle on that full view, you can incorporate it into all of the data describing the operations decisions that your teams are making day in and day out. So at a glance, C-State is a platform agnostic integration of site data. So what I mean is Scoot Science does not make hardware. Scoot Science doesn't advocate for a particular sensor. In fact, one of the ways that, that C-State came together was behind the belief that the innovation that fish farms are seeing on the hardware side today is just phenomenal. And the way to best use all of the innovations you see on the hardware side is to have a platform that can treat all incoming ocean data the same. It doesn't matter if you're moving to a new, more innovative sensor. If you're talking about sea lice data, for example, with um, Atlantic salmon, it shouldn't matter if you're talking about sea lice data that comes out of um, uh, you know, manual inspection of the fish or some of the new computer vision inspection of the fish, right? There's, there's a need for integrating in a hardware agnostic way, and that's what Sea state does. You know, we give teams real-time notifications across all the different systems that they're running about dangerous conditions in the ocean. Partly, you know, we're sending out uh, notifications with text and email alerts, but also we've started to have our customers get comfortable with looking at map-based rendering of farm conditions. It's really like um, giving farms access to the underwater weather forecast. Right now you have farms coming in, looking down at the lay of the land for the whole stretch of coast where they operate, um, and then looking at what they can expect in the coming days. Now, there's a lot of regional ocean modeling uh, that oceanographers use um, to look at lower resolution uh, changes in ocean conditions. And I'm talking about like under the surface of the water changes in oxygen levels, temperature, uh, strong subsurface currents coming up uh, and, and plankton loads. Uh, that regional overview is helpful, but the fish farms, you know, operate um, you know, on the size of a few football fields. And so Sea State gives um, site-specific ocean modeling. You have really good ocean observing at these sites. Um, and that's what an oceanographer needs to run a physics-based site-specific model. I think it's really important. So, you know, Sea State, Scoot Science, we use pretty sophisticated uh, machine learning and AI tools, but fundamentally, the ocean observing that's coming in at these farms is the kind of ocean observing data that's been used for many, many decades in oceanography to run a physics-based model. So we run a standard physics-based model at each individual site, and then we can give farms site-specific forecasts of oxygen and temperature and salinity. 
We also, because all the data is integrated in the same place, and we have a good understanding of the ocean risk that the site fields, um, we're able to give our customers what we call an integrated welfare index. So it's you know one score that looks at the importance of a rapid change in salinity relative to the baseline temperature you've been at, the oxygen loads that you're at. Um, we also have direct data entry for all kinds of custom data that our customers um, are collecting every day. So there's a few problems, we have some problem solution slides to really like dig in and show you a bit of how this is used. So one major problem that we address with C-State is that there's really too much data coming in off of farm sites in modern aquaculture today. It's um, It's been awesome to see how much good data is being collected at the sites already and how much you know how much additional data will be coming in um, as you get you know more and more uh, innovations on the hardware side but what's happened is basically the farms are overwhelmed by all these data streams and it gets really hard to look at your data if you're flipping between you know I completely reasonable to be flipping between 10 different platforms for looking at the data describing conditions at a modern fish farm. So C-State, the so baseline unifies, manages and renders data across all the different platforms. And the dashboard looks like this. So you can see um, just at, at this site here, the top of the dashboard, there's, there's a lot of pages in the dashboard, but just so you can see the opening scene, the top of the dashboard gives farms the headlines describing the site on that day. So what is, today's temperature range, oxygen range, salinity range. Now you wanna be able to see and dig into the high resolution time series that describe data in the individual pens. And you can see that um, then on the lower part of the screen, um, but there's a whole set of headlines that give uh, farm operators a way of just assessing the relative health that day of the site. And so you can see that in the headline section, we're integrating from across many different platforms, the fish inventory system, for example, describing um, how many fish they have in the water, uh, the size of the fish, uh, the feed use for that day. It's all sitting just in the, the immediate page that sits up um, pretty much continuously um, on the on-site computers, but also back in the main offices away from these remote sites. This is the first time that you can just flip between sites. You get a bird's eye view of all the conditions um, that your team is dealing with, but then also um, deep dive into each individual site from C-State. Now, the next problem that C-State really solves is this one of you know, largely marine operations, and this isn't this isn't just true of aquaculture, but I'd say marine operators more broadly would consider the ocean to be a black box. They'd say, you know, we actually don't know when these risky conditions are coming our way. Um, that's that doesn't totally jive with how an oceanographer looks at the oceans. An oceanographer says, well, when there's good ocean observing we can get good forecasting of ocean variability in extreme ocean events. So problem of not knowing when a risk is coming is really solved with C-State because we are able to give farms the regional and then the site specific forecasts um, that come out of having good ocean observing on the sites in the first place. So we, we really lean into different oceanographic methods for rendering the wide scale regional conditions, which you see on the left hand side, um, and then the site specific models where you have typically farms at the, the barge of an Atlantic salmon farm. Daily, you have measurements of temperature and salinity and oxygen at several depths down in the water column. Well, that's what an oceanographer needs to run a numerical based physics model. So um, this is this is why really we liken it to the underwater weather because it's really similar to the way that we access weather forecasts, um, uh, you know, just on land as individuals. The next problem that Sea State, you know, has really focused on is okay if you have a lot of data coming in. How do you make sense of that tangled mess of ocean and fish health threats that you've been monitoring? A lot of times you'll get data streams describing conditions that actually act in opposition to each other, right? So like maybe 
you start to see waters approach more favorable growth temperatures, but in doing so, carry a lower oxygen level with them. That kind of conflict that you see across all these data streams makes it really difficult to look at the integrated welfare of the fish on a site. Um, and so we have, we call it seaweed, it's Scoot's Integrated Welfare Index, to look at the total integrated stressors that are impacting the fish and survivability at each individual site. Together, if you take the forecasts and the data integrations in CWE, we say that C-State gives farms the ability to identify the risks that they're facing, to look at when they need to take action. And then with the CWE index, the, the way that it's used by farms is really giving them some direction on how they're going to address the risks that are coming. For example, um, you know, if you have uh, scheduled uh, uh, treatment for the fish coming in the midst of a low seaweed index and a poor oceanographic forecast, then farms will use it to um, reschedule the treatments or reallocate resources so that they're not further stressing the fish out at one of the worst times um, to, to come in and actually do operations. So that was, so I went over, you know, in the beginning, well, Scoot Science is you know, working to make the oceans manageable, insurable, and investable. And so I'll talk a little bit about insurable and investable. So the risk and finance team at Scoot is able to work with farms and all of that ocean data and the forecasting to help enhance the risk solutions that they have in place. So you maybe have heard about parametric risk cover for um, weather threats in land-based ag. That actually hasn't been possible in oceans uh, until SCOOT, right? So SCOOT is able to work with farms to assess down to the site level, the likelihood, the severity, the frequency of a risk, like take, take really cold temperatures. Um, there's a phenomenon where you have really cold temperatures at five meters depth. Um, that uh, that in some parts of Canada kills fish. With Scoot and Sea State, we've been able to do a really good job categorizing the frequency and the severity of that risk and setting up uh, farms in a position where they can, for the first time, work with reinsurers who are willing to say, oh, actually, we can see a really clear understanding a model of the risk that you hold, that's a risk that we can price with you and give you coverage for instead of considering this threat totally unpredictable. And once you cap downside risk like that, um, you know, when, when you have a really good handle on the operations that a farm is going to take, a really good way of being transparent about the, the factors affecting survivability of the fish in the water. When you cap the downside risk with really specific um, uh, risk cover based on the historical and forecasted risk at a site, well, then, then aquaculture farms in the ocean start to become investable, right? So if you can if you can connect the ocean dynamics, identify how ocean dynamics are coupled to your business outcomes, then for the first time, aquaculture goes from being this, you know, I, I think culturally you'd say like with aquaculture today, it's a pretty risky endeavor. It's highly profitable and very risky. And so you can imagine the pitch is like, hey, I need a lot of capital to do this thing that's super risky, but if it works out, like, You'll, you'll do great. There's been very little modeling available to um, you know, commercial finance in, in a way that they can look at the risks of aquaculture, they can understand the ways risks are being mitigated, um, and then they can start to model out how the business is actually coupled to ocean conditions. So we'd say the problem for that, despite decades of profitability, Aquaculture financing is still a very challenging environment. We call it an isolated environment. So the solution that Scoot came up with um, is, you know, with our understanding of how fish farms work and our understanding of oceanography, we could start to identify through our sea vest model how uh, the, the ocean conditions through the whole industry drive the, the um, 
production and profitability around the world. So we have CVEST, it's an ocean-driven sustainability-linked global model that you'd use for financing aquaculture. And we really see this as the key to having aquaculture meet some of the global ambitions around aquaculture really filling a role in food security. To do that, we need more commercial finance in this space. And to bring more commercial finance in this space, we have to have a much clearer picture of how the business is coupled to a risky ocean. Um, so the CVEST model has modules that cover operations, the earth systems globally, how temperature, oxygen is changing around the world, biology, survivability in different regions around the world, um, uh, how production works, uh, markets, uh, you know, really we're able to, with CVEST, um, start to, you know, bring in the, the price of diesel into, um, uh, you know, a simulation of, of global cash flows. Um, what we have with CVEST is historical cash flows for all salmon farms around the world. So we're running CVEST on about 3,700 uh, salmon sites globally. Um, we have a historic reconstruction of the historic performance and and that uh, it's been pretty phenomenal to see if you have a good understanding of the ocean's behavior globally, then you um, can start to do a bottoms up uh, simulation of how the industry has felt changing ocean conditions. We've done it for the past 10 years. Um, we have in-house modeling of uh, pricing, growth, our sustainability metrics are down to individual assets. Um, you know, and I think fundamentally for aquaculture, the most sustainable aquaculture operation is going to be the aquaculture operation where you have the highest survivability, right? And we're able to see that through the CVEST model and by you know really linking ocean conditions um, to uh, the, this global industry. Overall, our team is working to build the most comprehensive framework available for managing ocean risk. And I think that the progress that we made um, just in the past couple of years has been pretty phenomenal. I'll take a second to plug. Um, we just released a white paper describing our risk and finance group and the whole CVEST model. Um, you can go to our website and download the paper. It's called Green Sharp. Um, it's, it's pretty detailed, so it's a 100-page long analyst white paper that describes how the CVEST model um, uh, really gets a picture of the global aquaculture industry and what's going to be possible um, you know, in commercial finance now that um, we can look at you know, not just historical performance of these sites, but we're going to be able to start looking at, you know, for different parts of the world, how we anticipate sites uh, performing under changing ocean conditions. That's it for the overview of Scoot. I uh, really appreciate um, being invited to, to be on, and I'd love to take any questions. Awesome, John. Well, we really appreciate the, the presentation. I think the, the world of, of ocean analytics remains un tapped in terms of how much information is out there, how much useful information is out there, not only to aquaculture, but likely a wide variety of other industries. So we appreciate the, the work that you guys are doing. Um, uh, as John may have alluded to here, um, if you do have questions, the best way to ask a question is to type it directly into um, the Q&A box. Um, and then I'll answer those questions in the order that they're received. Uh, please make sure the questions are, are clear and readable so that I can, um, I can read them as they are written. Um, but I'll kick things off here. One thing that came to mind for me, John, um, you know, we, we spent some time looking at a wide variety of different types of aquaculture operations. Um, and obviously, in terms of those that have access to high quality ocean data, we're, I think, typically talking about some specific types of aquaculture. Um, I, I'm curious at the operations that you guys work with to partner with for data and then provide analytics and insights to who, who's qualified at each of these companies in order to use that data to make real decisions based off of what is what's what at least on the surface looks like a pretty complex set of information yeah it actually comes down to the individual site managers right so decisions about there's i i think one of the things that comes up um right away when you talk about mitigating 
uh, an extreme ocean event is uh, changing the feeding schedule. So um, largely what they see is that if a fish has a full belly, it has a harder time surviving uh, stressful ocean condition. So, um, you know, if you can see uh, a stressful condition, let's say a low oxygen event coming, um, along with all the kinds of mitigation you could run, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, use oxygen generation or aeration to mix waters, the most basic and really effective way to navigate the risk is say, well, we're not going to feed today, right? But that, that is down to the, the decision is most often made by the site manager. The tricky thing is the site manager's job is to feed the fish every day, right? So to like stay on, right? If you're going to hit your production goals and you want your fish um, eating. Um, uh, and so that's one of the decisions. It has a huge impact on surviving extreme events. You know, we've seen even with plankton blooms, um, just by, by um, it's a difference is as little as like four hours in the feeding schedule, we've seen three times the survivorship at a site that holds back from feeding versus falling through with the feeding. Um, and that, um, that kind of decision, it really is site by site. Now there's other decisions that, especially for the bigger groups. So, you know, Scoot works with some pretty big farming groups and they're managing um, you know, tens of sites across a region. And it tends to be that decisions around, um, decisions around like, let's say treatments for the fish, um, or even decisions around like transferring the fish out, like when on the stocking schedule, when you're actually going to move the fish into the ocean, um, those are made, uh, you know, more in the, main office by the production director by the environmental teams um, and they you know they they use this same data but would look more at the historical context instead of like the day in and day out decision making that a farm manager takes got it um that's very interesting and and could I mean, you mentioned a couple of the a couple of the risks that can be acted upon by by these site managers mm -hmm. Are there, are there any that when you guys started out were the ones that were really like the low hanging fruit where this was a recurring problem and are, they, are there any others that you sort of uncovered as you spent more time with customers that you perhaps didn't, didn't know were a risk at the time? Yeah, well, I'd start maybe with the, it's not necessarily, I, I don't know that I'd call it low hanging fruit, but I know that one of the, one of the things that that really kick-started the work that scoot does was around this phenomenon called super chill um, and super chill you know had caused some devastating losses in eastern canada um back in 2014 um really bad losses i i mean just super chill happens every so often the waters in eastern canada get so cold because of uh you know kind of cold winter, but a particular kind of winter storm coming through uh, that the gills of the fish freeze over. It's um, it's the losses were so big that a lot of people considered it like an existential threat for the industry in Eastern Canada yeah. um, at the time. And for oceanographers, you know, because Scoot started initially, it was a, a group of ocean scientists that, that then, you know, now we have, now our group is veteran um, uh, fish farmers and ocean scientists and software engineers and underwriters. Um, but, you know, for oceanographers looking at that problem and calling the super chill just totally unpredictable like that, that didn't make sense to us because it was sort of this thing like, well, if, if you have really good ocean monitoring, then you should at least be able to get a handle on the frequency and severity of that, you know, really specific problem at a specific ocean depth. Um, and so that, you know, that's one of the ones where I'd say like, you know, super chill is considered totally unpredictable and the team at Scoot was able to show that actually we can recreate the past 20 years of super chill like really well um to within a day of it happening and it's a very manageable risk moving forward so yeah that's the main that's that's the first one that comes to mind but i think that also i mean 
you know, out in British Columbia, we've um, found really good results with forecasting for low oxygen events. I think, you know, what, what we found is that, you know, the farmers that we work with know so much about how the ocean operator or how the ocean works, how it operates, that a lot of the development of sea state and scoot was with farms describing phenomena that they knew but not just not being able to translate that out externally so it's like oh well actually we know oxygen is a problem always at this part of the tidal cycle and we know that it's a problem at these sites and not these sites but now like being able to show that and then show oh you know what once you understand and forecast that oxygen problem, then you can actually get some lead time on all the steps you'd take to protect the fish. I think that that's, that's really how sea state evolved. Um, it, it makes me think of a little bit about um, the different types of farm management systems, data capture systems we've seen in agriculture. Um, we've seen it deployed at more scale, but still has yet to, there's still so much more growth that industry has in terms of its potential. But there's, there's, there's a couple different stances that some of those products will take. Some of them are, we're a data product and we trust farmers and those with agronomic expertise to make smart decisions based off of data that they have. And the problem is they just don't have the data to work with. There's others where they're building products that allow for like action, like specific actions. Like one, one that I find is, is very common is in, um, in livestock management technology. We'll see companies that specifically are, are alerting um, farmers and, and operators of a calving event or that an animal's in heat and then they, they, they breeding should take place of, of some kind um, or mastitis has occurred. In this case and with Scoot, are you guys making actionable recommendations or are these, is this an instance in which these operators just don't have a way of seeing the data in an actionable way and all they need is a means by which to see and then act upon it. They already know the right things to do. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll work with our customers work with farms to develop, you know, whenever there's a way to automate the decision-making process, um, we will bring that online with the farms. But first and foremost, the, the platform is a tool for the really, I would go back to individual site managers to be able to make the decisions that they know are the right decisions in the moment, but they just need to see a little bit. It's really like, um, uh, you know, I, I liken this to land-based weather a lot, right? If you're, if you're planning some kind of trip for the weekend and you have 30 seconds to glance down and see, is it going to be raining this weekend and I should bring a raincoat or is it going to be a sunny weekend and I can wear shorts? Um, nothing like that has been available for ocean-based aquaculture before. And just as a starting point, giving farm managers the tool to be able to look down and say, hey, like, is there something major coming on the horizon? Or like, is it going to be pretty much standard operations? It just um, goes, uh, uh, you know, has such a big impact on, on their own decision making. Um, yeah. But that's, that's the starting point. We'll get to the point, though, where I think, you know, we with the farms um, do a really good job of identifying um, not just like threshold values being crossed, but sometimes the, what you're looking at is not an absolute value, but a rate of change in the ocean waters that would be more stressful on the fish than actually just moving to a new condition. Um, and, and we've already seen ways that we can start to do some indications like more auto, you know, kind of like giving a heads up, like, Hey, like there's a change coming, but also like pay attention to this the rate of change is going to be really important, have a big impact on the welfare of the fish. Yeah. I like your, I like your analogy about the, um, the planning, the weather for the weekend. Cause I think some of those things that we, that we almost take for granted as just everyday users and consumers of technology and data products. Like you don't, you don't recognize that they, these things still don't exist in a lot of, in a lot of industries and how big of an impact, like, like one of like, one of the companies we work with is a company called Earth Optics, and they make really high fidelity soil carbon maps. Mm -hmm. And their partners had just never seen a map, had never seen a map that had this information before in like in a true gradient. And um, just being able to see it in that way just changes the way that you can make decisions. You know, it, it, it's it, 
for something that seems so simple, you know, like the way you draw that comparison to sunny or is it rainy? Is it this or is it that? Yeah, well, and I think so there's one on the one hand, like the the farmers being able to see it super powerful, but but in addition to that, what we see is being able to share it outside of um you know just the the immediate um site managers or the immediate office but being able to show you know we said with the risk and finance group being able to show for example an agricultural underwriter the risk that you know and I, i'm talking about land-based ag like being able to show the risk that each individual site holds um you know for fish farming it actually opens up a whole new set of possibilities for working with reinsurers that are not, it's a really small market of reinsurers that work with the survivability of, um, you know, specific species of fish in specific parts of the world. Well, for the first time, you can actually start to access a whole new side of, um, you know, commercial finance because you can share the data and be transparent about the data with non-fish farmers and that i think like that has a huge powerful aspect to it yep yeah um john i the last question i want to ask and just pausing here for a moment to see if there's anything from the audience now that we've had a chance to sort of uh talk about a few different areas um what's where do you guys need the most help right now and, and how can the if the the audience can help you what's the most use how, how what's the best way they can be useful and how can they reach you yeah, well, so we I mentioned our white paper describing the global aquaculture model, uh, CVEST. Um, so uh, we are spending a lot of time now talking to um, commercial lenders, private equity groups, uh, uh, ESG investors that are that are experienced with um, uh, food systems and land-based agriculture. Um, and looking at aquaculture as a market to get into, um, but haven't been able to yet because, like I said, there hasn't been much transparency into, um, you know, the way a farm operates, the way a farm manages its, um, uh, its uh, you know, caps its downside risk, um, and then actually the way a farm accounts for its um, uh, sustainability for its carbon footprint. So we would love to talk to anyone in that space. So again, land-based ag, commercial finance space that is looking to get involved because we're we're doing a lot of development of the CVS model, like I said, to bring the kinds of tools that are available in land-based ag to oceans. Um, and so we're looking for partners uh, that will that will help us do that. Um, so I, I think the most important thing, like go and download and read the green sharp white paper and then reach out, reach out to us um, if it's the if it's the kind of work, or the, the kind of tools that um, you have experience in for um, land based farming. Cool. Well, uh, John, really, really great to reconnect. It's really exciting to hear of all the progress you guys are making in a really important area and a really uh, scientifically interesting um, area as well. Um, I'd like to also thank the audience for your participation today, either live or, or via recording. Um, please do for, for, reach out to us or reach out to John if you'd like to learn more about what they're working on at Scoot. Um, uh, for anybody who's new, uh, we host agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. And if you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do so. A replay will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours, and new viewers can register for agri-food conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Um, if you'd like to learn more, uh, join us next week. Um, we'll be joined by Yannick Nyberg, CEO, founder and CEO of Seawater Solutions. Um, Seawater Solutions is taking two of the world's most abundant resources, degraded land and seawater, and creating wetlands that capture carbon, create jobs, produce, wind, produce food, rewild the environment, clean waterways, and stabilize coastlines. Um, John, thanks so much for your time today. Um, congrats on all the progress to Scoot, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Yeah, thanks so much, David. Thanks. Bye. Bye.